Welcome to Aberdeen Proving Grounds, Hidden History. I am Sean Keefe, your host, along with my co-host, Susan Thompson. Hi, Susan. Hi, Sean. How are you today? I'm fantastic. I'm so glad to hear that. And here we are again, Susan, back with more of Plum Crazy at Plum Point. Did you ever think we'd have so much to say about Plum Point? (laughs) Never in a million years. But that would make this part three and the last part of Plum Crazy at Plum Point. That's right. So to start off, Susan, let's give our audience a look at Plum Point when the Army came marching in in 1917. All right. So for a little background, the Army decided that their current proving ground, which was located at Sandy Hook, New Jersey, no longer met their requirements, especially as we were entering World War I. It was too small. It was too close to New York City. The shipping was problematic out of New York Harbor. So they decided they had to find a more remote location to put a new proving ground. And they were looking in the Maryland area. And their first choice was actually Kent County, Maryland. But there was a very strong political objection. And they had organized themselves and pushed back against the army coming in for their land. And this is Kent County. This is Kent County, the people, the citizens of Kent County. So at the time, the person charged with finding a new place was Colonel Colton Ruggles, who was the commander of Sandy Hook Proving Ground. He happened to have a friend and former classmate from West Point. He was a former major, E.V. Stockham. And he lived in this area, and he was a canner and owned land. And he was really the local proponent for getting the proving ground here in Harford County. Because there was equal objections to the Army coming in and taking this valuable farmland, which we talked about in our first part Mm -hmm. of Plum Crazy at Plum Point. This Mr. Stockham really organized local meetings where he brought Colonel Ruggles down to talk about the patriotic need for the Army to have property as soon as possible. Because Mm -hmm. at this point, we had entered World War I. There were soldiers deployed. It was a very, very much an imperative that was conveyed to the citizens that we needed this land. And at the time, Colonel Ruggles, operating under the authority of Secretary of War Baker, was told that he could offer up to the citizens, not only would we pay for the land that we were acquiring, and the going rate was about $100 an acre, but that the Army would also pay for any damages, meaning loss of business, loss of resources that would result from the Army taking these lands that, as we know, were under cultivation. They were being used to supply the canning business, et cetera, et cetera. Um, That ended up not really happening so much because it was difficult to prove, and it ended up in court all the way through the 1930s. Before we go any further, one thing that I kind of struggle with, they first initially wanted Kent County. Right. Right. But wouldn't it make more sense to have it where Aberdeen is today that way? Because Kent County would be considered like the eastern shore. Right. And farther away from D.C. in a direct line since you have the water separation right. there. So why didn't they go with Aberdeen to begin with? I don't know exactly. Maybe it was like how many acres were available or what they thought was you know, the available land at the time. But really, it ended up working out because, of course, the railroad line was already running as it Mm -hmm. is today. The the line still exists. And it was an established market with the canneries. And so, and we are close to water for shipment and things like that. So it was, it was a good location. It's a great location because you're just south of New York, you're north of Virginia, and you're east of D.C. When you look at it, I guess, like on paper, it's it's a great location. It's ideal. And there you go. So 1917, everyone was required to be out as of January of 1918. That was, you know, it went through a couple of different proclamations by the president taking the land, forcing people out. Um, by eminent domain. Eminent domain. Like we were, we were coming, we were taking the land, mm-hmm. we were going to start using it right away. Um, And we've talked about some of the major farmers who were here, but you have to remember it wasn't only the rich people who were being displaced, but all the tenant farmers. There was a large African-American population in the Michaelsville area who were tenant farming, Mm -hmm. and they were also forced out of 
their lands and what was a thriving do we community ha- at the do time. Do we have a number of how many families were displaced? I don't have a specific number. It was about 35 square miles of property that okay. was taken. Um, but, I mean, it was a fair number of people. And this is people. not even including the Edgewood area. Right. right. This, this is, is just, this is just Aberdeen, Aberdeen. what we refer to as Aberdeen North today. Right. Correct. Okay. So the Army comes in, end of 1917, beginning of 1918. Right away, they start building. They start moving people down from Sandy Hook on November 17th, 1917. Like mm. this group came down. There were people constructing, you know, coming in to build things. But it was kind of a mess because it was winter. It was cold. It was farmland. It was farmland. It was mostly cultivated farmland yes, where which, they were growing corn. Which makes the soil very soft. Right. It was very muddy and sandy and difficult to work in. But, you know, that doesn't stop the Army. They had a mission. When the armistice was signed on November 11th, 1918, there were already 324 buildings located at Aberdeen Proving Ground that had been built within a year which is pretty amazing when you think about it. But you have to remember, these were temporary structures. The army threw them up to house people. There were military barracks. There were civilian barracks. There were hospital buildings. There were warehouses. There were garages. It was sort of an industrial uh, sort of landscape. Was it a very makeshift, not permanent type of structure? So, you know, these are probably just thin... These are wooden construction for the most part. They weren't meant to last. Um, That doesn't mean some of them don't. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I personally experienced working in World War I barracks down at Edgewood for the first 12 years of my Army career. But, you know, they had some issues. (laughs) (laughs) Just a few, I'm sure. So the landscape right at the end of World War I is kind of... Industrial, you know, as we talked about, Quarters One exists, the Hopkins House exists, but they're sort of thrown in with a lot of barracks, a lot of... So structures start going up around these existing homes. Right, right. That's sort of where a lot of the activity is focused. The things that weren't directly related to the testing mission were mostly all in that Plum Point area. But the testing, the explosions, the firing ranges, those were all to the south of the Plum Point area. So where the main front was, where the Trench Warfare Division was, Mm -hmm. and the impact areas were to the south of there. So where we have Plum Point today, that was never part of the testing mission. That was always sort of the administrative center of what was Aberdeen Proving Ground at the time. To give our listeners who live and work on the Proving Ground today, when the Army purchased the land in 1917, they were purchasing the area, which was Plum Point and south of Plum Point. Right. So the where the PX is and the commissary is, none of that was right. part of the purchase. Right. The gate was actually sort of around, right around where the uh, Stone Guard House is now. Yes. And it was just like a road. There was a gate. There was a visitor's house. There was... And there was a train station in the area, too, mm-hmm. because that was a lot of the traffic that was coming in and out mm-hmm. was by train. And so the boundary was really there. If if you know sort of where Boothby Hill Road is, yes. that was sort of the boundary of Aberdeen Proving Ground at the time. Everything to the west, where we currently sit, where mm-hmm. the Route 17, where 715 Where the majority of the commands, is, the existing commands are today, is was not part of the original purchase. Right. That was all part of the World War II era expansion of APG. Got it. Got it. Because basically where they're testing today is where they were testing then right. as well. And Plum Point, like you mentioned before, was just housing and administration. Right. So after World War I ends, the Proving Ground, you know, is here with its temporary building sort of laid around. In 1919 was really the first construction of houses that are still there at Plum Point. There were a, a series of 14 officers' housing built at Plum Point. There were eight up north, close to Quarters One that were built, and then six duplexes that were built around Hopkins House. So the Hopkins Row area and then the frame officer's housing to on the northern part of Plum Point were the first permanent buildings constructed at APG. And Quarters One always remaining 
right. the senior commanders. Right. That oh. was, as we've said in the past, from the time that the Army occupied APG Quarters 1 has been the commanding officer's house. Got it. So after World War One, a lot of Army installations are just sort of, you know, going along. There was still a little bit of a testing mission. A lot of what was going on was um, recovery of foreign military equipment that we were testing here. That has been a point of interest since the installation was established. And uh, so, but as I said, most of these buildings were temporary structures. There were fewer people in them, but people were still occupying them. Beginning in about in the mid-1920s, there started to be some public outcry about the conditions that soldiers were having to live in because people were still occupying these temporary structures that were put up very quickly to meet the needs of an army, Mm -hmm. but they weren't meant for permanent occupation. So about that time, Congress gets together and decides to sell off some of the army installations or military installations that they didn't feel they needed anymore. Is this kind of like a BRAC? It's sort of BRAC, but before it's not called Wait, BRAC. Yeah, sure. Right. But it's sort of the same idea. So they took some properties and sold them. And then they used the monies from selling those properties to fund permanent construction at the army installations that they decided to keep. That includes Aberdeen Proving Ground, it includes Fort Meade, places like that that you around Maryland. So it's really at that time that the idea starts to develop to redesign Plum Point because as we've talked about, it was kind of a higgledy piggledy. Higgledy piggledy. <laughs> Woohoo. It was a lo- <laughs> it was it was it was, it was a very so while while there was officers housing up at the very north end of Plum Point, the rest of the peninsula was being used for a lot of purposes. The hospital was there from 1918. Um, that's where the soldiers who died during the flu epidemic were oh, treated. That's right. Um, we had like 81 soldiers who who perished um, due to the flu epidemic, and some of them ended up being buried at the APG cemetery um, right around where Shore Park is mm-hmm. now. That's why that cemetery was established because the few people they couldn't repatriate to their families ended up being buried at this okay. newly created cemetery. The, so the first construction that happened at Plum Point after World War I was actually what was built as a replacement hospital. It was built in 1932, and it's a little different from the rest of the structures at Plum Point because it's a brick building, and that was meant as permanent hospital construction. And it later transitioned away from being a hospital as bachelor officer's quarters now. Mm -hmm. So when you say that it was a brick building, prior to to this construction, was everything just wood yes. at the time? They were one-story, long, gable-fronted buildings okay. that were like wards. Okay. So there were different, there were multiple buildings mm-hmm. that served as the hospital. But, you know. Yeah, because there's no question the first thing you build is is a hospital. Right, right. So during this time, the Army's starting to move towards um, sort of an idea of planned landscapes, planned communities, which was part of the urban design movement that was happening in the 1930s anyway. And this all came under the auspices of the Quartermaster Corps. So the Quartermaster Corps had these standardized plans that they used throughout the country, but they adapted them to the local environment. So from Virginia North, they were basically colonial revival styles, in, and they used them in the Pacific Northwest, too. In California, they did like a Spanish mission revival style. They did more French provincial style down in Louisiana and areas like that. But at Aberdeen, they have a little bit of an additional twist in that they used local building materials instead of brick. Oh, is this where port deposit right. comes in? They used okay. the port deposit granite which is a lovely stone, to face all of the buildings that they were constructing at the time. So it was a pretty large construction project to build what is currently our officer's housing at Plum Point. 
Um, I believe it's like over 70 structures were built. And there's three different styles of housing that they built. They all blend in together, but it's not all the same building all mm-hmm. across the installation. So there's a two-story version. There's a one-and-a-half-story version with flared eaves, which is sort of a Dutch colonial style. And then there's a smaller one-and-a-half-story with just a gable end, and they have sort of um, an L behind them. So those were like the three different styles of housing that they and built. And this was 19... 19- this was 30. in the beginning in the 1930s, so around 1933 or so. And this is really coming out of um, not only the need for the army to build permanent buildings, but it was also part of the um, New Deal movement yes. and finding work for people. So it was of part that. of the Public Works Administration and the Works Progress Administration that they were using... Um, men who were employed under these administration services to construct the properties. They used them to help stabilize the shoreline around Plum Point. Mm -hmm. Which is still evident today. Right. So so really what we see at Plum Point um, with this centralized space was part of the planned design to have a pleasant environment for the officers. You it's know, very lovely. It's curvilinear streets. They use landscape plantings. It was meant to be like a nice neighborhood. And at Plum Point, it's really ideal because the houses are laid out along the shoreline, mm-hmm. leaving the big center part open. Great place to put a golf course. <laughs> and they did. And there was, there was a nine-hole golf course in the middle of of Plum Point for years and years and years. Um, so you have Quarters One. Right. Okay. And this is a good time to bring it up. So Quarters One was also remodeled at this time. So this is one of the pre existing homes uh, prior to the Army's arrival. And when they were doing the officer housing, they also redid the facade and, well, one of the many changes to Quarters One with that same granite. Right. So really, this was their opportunity to make Quarters One stand out Mm -hmm. as the commanding officer's house. From what I've read, they really tore down a lot of the existing farmhouse. We think mostly what's left is is the kitchen. Um, And they rebuilt it because, as we heard from Lucas last time, the walls are actually thick, so they are stone construction, So, which was not the original farmhouse. And they made it look grand and imposing. It's different from any other house Yes, um, because it has large columns that face out onto what was the golf course, mm-hmm. the public area. Um, so how great is it to step out the front of your house and you can overlook the bay? Right. And hey, if I want to go sit out back, I can. I got a beautiful golf course, which is no longer there. Right. But at one time, quarters of one is indeed, you know, a, a fantastic residence. A fantastic as place. As Lucas had uh, mentioned. In our last episode. But but the golf course really served like as the front yard, I would say, of these houses for a long time. I mean, up, up through the 70s, they're talking about running races around it, like they were bringing in oh. bike races and, okay. and foot races. And it was sort of looping through the installation. And the golf course is really a central part of what Plum Point was at the mm-hmm. time. Um, we actually have some a great photograph in our collection. We do. You've seen it, John. Have I? <laughs> oh, okay. So that sort of shows the open space, and it's from 191920. I'm not sure of the exact date, but it's of Colonel Phillips, who was the second commander mm-hmm. of Aberdeen Proving Ground after Colonel Ruggles. Unrelated to the Phillips Airfield. Right. Not the same. Phillips Airfield was named for someone else. Correct. But Colonel Phillips is center in front of a gazebo with his staff around him and off in the distance behind them you can see quarters one as it existed at the time mm-hmm. which was sort and of and this is a, a large house. panoramic photo right not like an eight by ten but a very large one of the ones that you usually see with military command right. or something like right. that the army at the time did have actual architects who were employed they were in the army who were designing some of the structures including the duplexes at Hopkins Row. The name on the plans of some of those duplexes was Philip Hubert Froman, who was in the Army from 1917 to 1919. And he would go on to become the final architect for the Washington's National Cathedral. Oh, wow. So, and he actually had a long career designing 
churches. He designed over 50 churches in mm-hmm. very grand Gothic styles. As Doesn't if, he have all those like secret gargoyles <laughs> and so on? I, I think there are the lots cathedral. of things. Um, he designed several churches in Baltimore. So he worked around the country. Obviously, those buildings are not in a Gothic style. They're a very craftsman style building. But it just shows you that the army was employing professional architects, professional Mm -hmm. designers, as they were starting to design military installations to be permanent military installations. Um, He was in the army from 1917 to 1919. Oh, so he was actually in the army when he was doing this, not as like an outside contractor. Oh, okay. Because he would have been employed with the quartermaster who had like the architects and the landscape designers, and they were the ones who would draw plans Mm -hmm. um, that that the army would then go on to construct. Y'all ready? You ready? Let's do it. I'm ready too. Dashing through the snow on one horse open sleigh. Or the fields we go and we're laughing all the way. Bells on the tail ring, we're making spirits bright. What fun it is to ride and sing on a sleighing song tonight. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Wow. Thank you to those members of Team APG for that fantastic rendition of Jingle Bells. I'm Major General Robert Edmondson, Senior Commander at APG. And I'm Command Sergeant Major Michael Conaty. Command Sergeant Major and I want to take a moment to express our sincere appreciation for your support to the installation, the Army, and this great nation. For more than 100 years, Aberdeen Proving Ground has been ready to support our warfighters, connected to our community, and our legacy, improving it every day. 2023 was certainly no different. From groundbreaking innovations to countless engagements with community and industry partners throughout the year, the work you do is remarkable and does not go unnoticed. Several advancements were made in APG on 2023, and the impact will be felt around the world. Our workforce is truly something unique and extraordinary, and you continue to prove it every day. None of this could be possible without the dedication of our workforce and support of our families and community partners. I'm excited to see how we will continue to prove it in 2024 on the hidden gem, APG. On behalf of APG and the Army family, happy Happy holidays. So now we're approaching World War II. Right. And that's really when, so the building campaign around Plum Point starts in the early 30s, goes through 38, 39. But at that point, there's starting to be a realization that, you know, a second war is imminent. It was decided to centrally locate all the ordnance school. They used to be located at mm-hmm. multiple installations, but Aberdeen Proving Ground was picked to be like the home of the ordnance school. So they started acquiring additional land to the west for the ordnance school, for increased testing missions, for a new airfield, Phillips Airfield, the new one. Okay. Um, That's really World War II is when we expand to sort of what our current sizes are. They even looked outside of our current boundaries. Like that's when the Churchville testing site, Mm -hmm. the automotive testing site was acquired. We even lease properties like the Batashu Company area, which is now the Water's Edge area that was leased by the Army for testing at various points in time. So World War II... There's a big expansion of Mm -hmm. Aberdeen Proving Ground, which we're not really going to get into in this episode. But other than the name change, which happened in 2018, which changed historic Plum Point PLUMB to Plum Point PLUM, not much has really changed from what it looked like after it was designed and built um, in the 1930s. It's considered eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. It's not actually on the register, but it's Mm -hmm. eligible for the register. And one of the reasons is because it is a... Well, you need to work on that, Susan. (laughs) I nominate you. 
the army doesn't really want them. Oh, <laughs> we'll okay. Believe that. Can, okay. How do, how do you stop recording? <laughs> okay. So there's no, there's no good reason for them to be on the mm-hmm. officially listed because the protections are the same, whether they're eligible or whether they're listed, it's the same level of protection. Mm-hmm. But one of the reasons that is eligible is because it is a great example of a designed military landscape. Susan, when I arrived here in 2004, the golf course at Plum Point Loop was just pretty much defunct. Well, mm-hmm. it was defunct. It wasn't used as a golf course at that time. I think people might have gone out there to hit a few balls, but it yeah, wasn't enough. It's kind of hard to hit when there's not a hole in the ground, though. <laughs> but in 2018, they utilized that property for a great purpose, what is now known as a living legacy forest. Right. And it's really a wonderful idea that has grown over time. So instead of having, you know, an empty space, they created what is called, as you said, the Living Legacy Forest, dedicated to the Gold Star community to really to give them a home so that they can find a place of comfort and reflect on the service that their family members provided to this country. It's a space where Gold Star families can share the stories of their loved ones. And it was developed in stages. Right, right. The area was dedicated, as you said, in in April of 2018. And then it has continued to evolve since then. They dedicated a Battlefield Cross Memorial in the following year, in the spring. And then in the fall, they opened the pavilion. And this is all very reflective of the existing architecture. So it's a wonderful addition Mm -hmm. to the Plum Point landscape because it reflects the stone. It's a place that's visible to the houses, but it's a place where the community can come and gather. The term Gold Star Family is a modern reference that comes from the first service flag, which was used during World War I. People would have these in their windows or fly them to let people know that they had someone from their family who was serving in the armed forces Mm -hmm. during World War I. And these were the little flags that was a star, blue being that you had a family member in the service. Right. And then if that person should fall in battle, then the star was changed to gold. Right. Right. So that people would be aware that this family had sacrificed someone in the service of the country. Mm-hmm. Um, so really, we started observing what was called Gold Star Mother's Day in 1936. So about the same time that Plum Point was being developed, this Gold Star concept was being developed, too. So it's really a great marriage between Plum Point and, and the Living Legacy Forest. Gold Star Wise was formed before the end of World War II. And then a lapel button was established in 1947. So really, this is Aberdeen Proving Ground's efforts to show that we remember the sacrifice of everyone who contributed their service, their lives to the country. So currently, the Living Legacy Forest is the site of at least yearly gatherings for Gold Star mothers, Gold Star families. Um, We dedicate new memorials to fallen soldiers every year. Currently, there are 90 soldiers who have been memorialized at the APG Legacy Forest. Susan, one thing that I also wanted to mention is that surrounding the pavilion in the plaza are the trees that were planted in memory of these fallen soldiers. Right. So the so the living forest, as mm-hmm. it was, as it is, is meant to reflect that the memories of the fallen soldiers will continue to live on, will continue to grow just as the forest grows, Mm -hmm. um, so that they will always be part of the APG community, as highlighted in the fact that they are in a central location that's sort of the heart of what APG was and continues to be into the future. And Susan, I think that's a wonderful way to wrap things up. Well, Sean, I think we've learned a lot throughout this process. I hope everyone listening has also learned something interesting, something fun, something they didn't know before. And uh, hopefully we we can return with more stories of of APG's hidden history. But before that, I'm going to need a break. All right, Sean. Because I'm spent. I'm done. Susan, I'd like you to enjoy this holiday with some much needed rest. I know working with me is is quite difficult. I'm very tolerant of you. (laughs) (laughs) What are your words of wisdom, Sean? My words of wisdom? There's nothing that a vodka and diet soda won't fix. (laughs) Did I? I I heard somebody say that one time. 
So I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in. This has been Aberdeen Proving Grounds Hidden History, Season 1, maybe a 2. Depends how much money they throw at us, Susan. (laughs) That's right. We don't come cheap anymore. I'm telling you, I think we got some leverage on them with this. Yeah. Peace and love. Come on, Susan, with me now. Peace Peace and and love. love. Thank you for listening.